This is Teresa Whistler for Hero Steam Center. I'm providing a voiceover for the presentation that was made on September 22nd as an informational session about the Whistler Observatory being built in Van Dyke Park in Red Lodge, Montana. Unfortunately, the Zoom capture, <laughs> the recording of the session uh, was, was tiny and it wasn't as it appeared up on the screen that was shared and, and recorded during the Zoom session. So again, my name is Teresa Whistler. I operate the Hero Steam Center in Red Lodge. I'm also a member of the Red Lodge Dark Skies group. And that night we had with us chair of that group of the Red Lodge Dark Skies group, Jeremy Battles. We also had Mayor Kristen Cogswell and a number of other community members that were interested in either the observatory, stargazing, or the Red Lodge Dark Skies group. So yes, we will have an observatory in Red Lodge. It's to be named the Whistler Observatory, and it's a Heroes Steam Center project. The goal of the project is to build and maintain an accessible observatory that accommodates night sky observation and educational activity in the set city of Red Lodge as a no-cost opportunity for anyone that has interest in astronomy, the night sky, and or related sciences and technology. The roll-off roof observatory is named Whistler Observatory in memory of Heroes Steam Center founder, Ken Whistler. Heroes is approaching its fifth year anniversary in February of 2024. The mission hasn't changed since the doors first opened. The mission is to serve as a place to create, explore, innovate, and share knowledge in Red Lodge. This is where experimenting equals play and things you imagine making or doing may be possible. Anyone, no matter what their background, interested in STEAM, science, technology, engineering, art, or math, has opportunities to pursue their interests through Heroes Steam Center and now the observatory as well. It works because we're donation, grant, and volunteer based. It, we draw from the experience and knowledge of area residents that are willing to share, collaborate, and teach without barriers of cost, affiliation, or question. It's open to everyone. The observatory project was initiated by the donation of an eight inch Celestron telescope from a gentleman that lives in Billings, David Darby. Earlier in the year, there was a dark skies group forming in Red Lodge and it was facilitated by heroes and meetings being held there. So one of the earlier Red Lodge dark skies members knew that their neighbor wanted to donate their telescope to a group that would use it. And we accepted the donation of the telescope but when it was picked up, it was delivered in a, a very heavy footlocker and also a separate bundle of the tripod, both very heavy and, and it would be very difficult for anyone to move them out into the field or continuously want to move them about and use them. So it was determined that in order to facilitate use of the telescope, we could use a small observatory in town. Later in November, an application to the Red Lodge Area Community Foundation was made requesting a community grant to help kickstart the project. The committee liked the project so much that they doubled the award. The request of $1,000 was awarded it as $2,000. And that's really how the project was born. So the acceptance of the community grant came with three requirements, basic requirements that we report at the end of the year how the money was used, that the money would be used within a year, and that I would sit with Kurt Nell, the astronomy teacher at the high school, to discuss how they might use the observatory or what it would mean to them. So I sat with Kurt Nell, and we did discuss, you know, the situation as it is, uh, that he can have his students out in the field maybe a couple times at best in the fall before the weather turns, and it's just too difficult to get out and do any observing. And then following that, um, because I was on planning board at the time, I was aware that the airport board was looking at having a master plan drawn up for the airport. I called Steve Smith 
and discussed with him whether or not the location that I had in mind within Van Dyke Park would be impactful or interfere with the runway protection zone. So Steve Smith provided me with this satellite photo and the description of the, the runway protection zone and the criteria. And we both determined and settled that the observatory did not interfere with that. Having determined that the location within Van Dyke Park didn't interfere with the airport, we went to, both Steve and I, Steve was invited to join me as I pitched this proposal to the Parks Board. Um, we went to the Parks Board. I presented a proposal for the location of the observatory within Van Dyke Park. And at the time we were asked to also move the observatory up toward the northern end of the park so that it was on the already disturbed area and didn't interfere with the native vegetation in the lower two thirds or, or, or other of the park. So ever since then, and in any of the discussions with Parks Board moving forward, we had pretty well cemented that the observatory location within Van Dyke Park would be in that upper northern end of the park um, not interfering with the native vegetation. And then uh, we also thought that it would be most important to have the location of the observatory within the city, make sure it's accessible to uh, most everyone and that it's not way out in the field anywhere, you know, further in the mountains or away from town, but the, that it's somewhere in the city and accessible to everyone. It's also still very dark up there on that end of town, and you don't have to look through the glow of the city center that comes upward and would interfere or degrade the, the dark skies. The initial proposal for the observatory in Van Dyke Park was made in early February, 2022. Parks Board prompted me to share the same proposal with Public Works to see if there was any objection. I sat with Jim Bushnell and there was none. I was also prompted by the Parks Board to notify BRTA about the potential impact to the trails should we build an observatory up there because we did plan on adding a pathway from the existing trail to the observatory. And we also wanted to make sure they understood that we would fix anything on their existing trails should the construction you know, disturb that. So there was no issue there. Finally, Parks Board had been able to make the recommendation for the location and the name to City Council for their review. City Council did review and approve the observatory location and name, and uh, that was at the end of April via the resolution 3599. So we really weren't sure because we had discussed within the Red Lodge Dark Skies group that we don't have the experience to understand um, yet, based on the experience of having star parties or having attended a number of um, astronomy sessions, we didn't really know how large the interest in the community might be. We didn't know how to gauge and, and determine the right fit and the, and the model for our community. So we weren't sure how to move ahead. And it was Jeremy Battles, Marty Clegg, and myself that sat down with Tim Swansboro and Brian Hanna for the city and discussed how we might move ahead and that we, you know, we really weren't done gathering all the requirements in order to determine the right size and model that we would move ahead with. So at that time, Tim Swansboro um, said that it would be okay for us to put down a partial viewing pad and it didn't require a building permit. And so that's exactly what we did. Uh, that would give us, buy us some time to really figure out um, what model to move ahead with. At that point, it was, everything was conceptual. So as soon as we had, <laughs> no sooner had we finished that meeting, that um, we started requesting estimates for partial viewing pad, and then the flood hit. So it was um, middle of June, and shortly after, I think everybody realized there was no way you were going to get a hold of a contractor and there was absolutely no concrete to be had. 
Uh, we weren't sure if we'd be able to put that down by the end of the year, although we were obligated to spend both the, the Hazel Chamberlain Award of $1,000 and the community grant of $2,000 before the end of the year or within the six months. So um, we were lucky enough eventually to get someone that could um, do it for us and, and that it would be done in um, mid-October. So ahead of that, we visited the um, Montana Learning Center, their backyard observatory, structures that are kept up at Canyon Ferry Lake and met with the executive director there, Ryan Hanahu. We also had a couple different stargazing events of our own, one up at the pad and one in uh, Yellowstone Wildlife Sanctuary. So by the end of the year, we were able to determine the size and the model that we wanted to go ahead with. And we are also initiating an MOU that was submitted to the Parks Board to a memorandum of understanding submitted to the Parks Board so that we could begin on finalizing that as well. I want to go back to the Parks Board presentation, the initial presentation, because there has been a lot of question or concern about how did this observatory come to be? It didn't go to planning board and, and whatnot. So I just wanted to make it clear that you know, we, we went through the proper procedures, and this is a slide from the very first presentation that was made to the Parks Board. We asked three things of the Parks Board, that they review Resolution 3459, which basically just um, states that the Van Dyke Park would be a, a dedicated park within Red Lodge as an open space and trail park with the potential for other recreational uses so that they understood the intent of the park when it was established and the fit with what we were proposing. The second ask was that they, by the time they were finished working with us on the details, that they would be in a position to hopefully recommend both the location and the name to city council for their review. And the third ask was that they would continue working with us to collaborate with Heroes and Dark Skies to determine an agreeable MOU. So all of those things were done and they were done in a very timely manner and we appreciated the efforts that the Parks Board has made along the way and for their patience on the numerous times that we did present and update them on what we were planning to do. Another one of the slides within the initial proposal to Parks Board was a slide that, that opened the discussion about the compatibility of the observatory within Van Dyke Park. So the open space park is, is a public land. It protects the natural environment. It provides recreation. It provides a common area for that recreation. And it includes a limited building. We don't have multiple buildings, but limited buildings is in the description and we only have one. The building of any kind should not be including driveways, parking lots, or other surfaces designated or intended for vehicular travel. So the observatory does meet all of the um, criteria and is compatible with Van Dyke Park. As a matter of gathering full requirements, we identified uh, several stakeholders. Stakeholders are individuals or groups that have a shared interest or benefit from the project. So we identified area schools and educators because they would have use of the facility to enhance their astronomy classes or field experiences. The Red Lodge Dark Skies group has the observatory as a place to invite the public to stargazing activities or certain events. And they can use those events to also educate everyone on you know, practices that mitigate light pollution. And then we also identified astrophotographers or astronomers that might be able to use the observatory, whether or not it's open for the public at the time, they can still come and use the, the, the concrete pad that surrounds two sides of the observatory to set up their equipment. It's still a dark place and the, the pad provides a, a good environment for setting up. Then the city of Red Lodge would also be able to say that they have an additional amenity and that the Chamber of Commerce may also 
um, grow astrotourism for Red Lodge and Carbon County. There isn't any reason that we can't invite the public to come out and enjoy our dark skies and make clear that we have an observatory and certainly that would provide an additional economic benefit to the city. Event planners can also uh, collaborate with Heroes or the Dark Skies group to add additional activities to events that they might be planning. They could invite you know, guests to their events to go up and also look at the observatory or the dark skies just using the um, facility in Van Dyke Park. So another thing we did to understand um, the, the requirements that we might consider uh, was a visit to the Montana Learning Center. They have three observatories up there at the northern end of um, Canyon Ferry Lake. The Montana Learning Center is run out of Helena and the executive director, Ryan Hanna, who pictured there is the one that met us a couple different times. We first went out in October of 2022, just me and Marty, um, scoped it all out and really learned an awful lot. Um, helped us, helped to persuade us to lean towards um, backyard observatories model, definitely because they had been so tested and true already up there with Montana Learning Center. We looked at the three different models that he had um, to sort of gauge what size might, might accommodate the um, uses here in Red Lodge and for our groups. Um, and, and that really was very helpful. We went back a second time to examine more closely how the roofing was constructed together with the motor, the wheels, the cogs, um, how it's windproofed and, and safely secured to the building, things like that. So the second time was a more detailed scrub through, and we had a larger crowd with us at that time. So by the end of it all, with all the requirements that we had learned of, um, we went with the Backyard Observatory Model CM2, Club Model 2. Uh, we selected the 16 by 24 size. This is from their galleries. This isn't exactly how ours would look but it is very close. And this is where we got the idea uh, from, for the, from the very beginning, the concept of having a concrete pad or what we were calling an apron around two sides of the building. This aids in having you know, more people with more room at some of the stargazing activities and gives room for setup so that people aren't tripping over uh, telescopes on the outside and gives you room on the inside for a fixed number of telescopes as well as a, a, a room in the back that doesn't get exposed to the night or the open sky, that's where there's operations and storage. So that's how we determined we would go with CM2 and Backyard Observatories model. So we ordered the plans, the blue line drawings for the plans from Backyard Observatories directly so that we could start getting estimates from different contractors on how much it would cost to build. Um, we also made some modifications and shared this view with the contractors, um, indicating that we wanted two outdoor um, entrances as well as one inside passage from operations and storage rooms into the observing room. We also decided that we would seal off um, the operations and storage room and not open it to the night sky. We would stop the roll off roof at 16 feet and that we wouldn't need the post and beams beyond the 16 feet behind the structure. Here are some additional details for the layout and the plan of the observatory. We had earlier scoped out a, a solar, a packable solar array that would serve a portable power unit having only four ports. What we learned from our stargazing events as well as visits up to Ryan Hanahoe at his observatories was that we probably wouldn't have sufficient um, energy to do everything we wanted, including lights and guiding people around the facility during the nighttime, plugging in different telescopes and, and computers and whatnot. So in addition to moving the roof and everything, uh, we decided we really needed something more, and that would be a fixed solar array feeding 
the batteries and inverters internal to the operations room. We asked the city if we could do that and we were told yes. So what that meant was that next I need to have an electrician, we'd need to have someone to work with us um, that could yet now provide an electrical design suiting a number of ports and lights internal to the observatory as well as the motor for the roll-off roof as well. So that's something that's in the works yet with MICA. We haven't received a design for the electrical work, but we do also have um, you know, more design details coming from our solar subcontractor to answer some of the questions that our building inspector had. And so that is a work in progress. Another detail for the observatory where the siding and the roof will be that steel gauge. Uh, we've decided uh, to have a Hawaiian blue uh, rooftop and light stone uh, siding. This matches best, I think, the, the environment up there in Van Dyke Park. It melds very nicely with uh, sage and the, the, the grasses in the fall as well as uh, clear skies in the summertime and in the, in the winter that blue will fade in and will not, will not stick out like a sore thumb. It'll be uh, at least something that's not so objectionable to look at in the field. So this year we've had a lot of activity and many more milestones and things were, have been moving quickly. Um, beginning of the year, we had several contractors that we had asked to provide us some cost estimates based on the plans from BYO as well as the documented modifications. And then we had continued working on the MOU and to the point where Parks Board was comfortable recommending it to the city for their review and approval at City Council. City Council did review and approve the MOU by the end of March. We had a couple different public events starting in February with the Green Comet stargazing activity up at the observatory. And that night we had about 50 people coming and going through the space of time that we were up there in 13 degree weather to see the Green Comet. So that was that was amazing. It was a good night, <laughs> a really good indication of the interest in our area and, and visitors that would come out. So a good way to gauge future events as well as the interest in our community. And then we had, again, a, um, an event down at the Wildlife Sanctuary. That went really well. And then, let's see, we continued writing grants and submitting them by deadlines that we had lined up for ourselves. Stanley Creek Construction was selected as our, our construction lead for the build of the observatory. And we were told that uh, the work there could start at the end of July and be done within the space of a couple weeks. So uh, we had already, um, before the build would begin, we will, will have already received the approval from the city and a build permit. So that was not an issue. And then uh, we went up to examine at the Montana Learning Center again, the roll top, top roof operation in greater detail, as well as fastening and, and the uh, methods of fastening it to the roof especially if we were to have high winds and things of that nature. Uh, we were also then notified later in June that um, our contractor would be able to start the pour earlier than expected, moving around a couple projects. And then a week before the pour was going to begin for the foundation, we found out that Northwest Energy transmission lines through the, uh, the edge of Van Dyke Park would be 20 feet taller and would also be continuously lit as well as um, having the wire lines up and down the field um, su suited with uh, big orange markers. So we gather together as an observatory subcommittee again and decided to halt the project until we knew if something could be changed or mitigated on Northwest Energy's part. And then Luckily, um, by the end of July, Northwest Energy did submit a statement to us that there would be no lights, no markers, and that everything would be FAA compliant um, regarding the airport and everything that was necessary, maybe might have been necessary. So somehow that requirement 
it was no longer a requirement because of the engineering design revision. And uh, we did resume the project of the observatory build. However, we weren't able to get our contractor back until mid-August. So the work has been in progress since mid-August. And um, we're just waiting now to hear about the three outstanding grants applications that were submitted, as well as you know when our um, our contractor can move ahead with some of the other equipment we've been waiting on most recently. This is our project cost breakdown for the build and mortar um, phase one and two of the project. It um, shows that the total cost of the initial viewing pad together with the uh, the fundamental structure and, and the continuation of the pad brings us to $54,791 if you round up. So we had to have the cost breakdown for purposes of our contractor estimates, as well as a number of the um, grant applications that were submitted. This slide represents the amount of funding that we have established so far. So for the donations, the donation column contains the Whistler family pledge of $20,000 plus the other 8,900 raised by individuals. And then on the grant column, you can see that we've raised $15,000 so far. And that brings us to a total of funds raised of $43,900. That's not quite the 54,000 plus needed to complete the brick and mortar build. We have spent already $34,569 to bring us to where we are today. And that means that the cost to complete our brick and mortar build is $20,222, but there is still money that has not been spent. So the next slide will explain where we are with that. Of the funds raised so far, we have $9,416 remaining that um, can be spent on the, the current progress and the, the build without the solar and without the electric. And then you can see here that there is other potential funding. There are three other grants that were applied for and are still outstanding. We don't know yet if we will be awarded any funds from any one of them yet. And then we'll continue with asking for individual donations and micro grants. Um, hopefully, we can achieve the target of $10,837 to complete the brick and mortar build, which is phase one and phase two. So that's where we are. Um, I just might mention that one of these uh, open grant applications is not eligible for the brick and mortar. And that $5,000 application, um, if it were, were to be awarded, could only be spent on phase three and not the capital build. So there's still enough potential funding and hopefully we get some of that to complete the brick and mortar. Progress on the construction to date. Um, we do have up the four walls. We're waiting on the addition of the trusses for the, the, um, the wheels and the bolts. The wheels are especially grooved. Uh, so that the roof rests on an angle iron, angle irons that run along the length of the building and can be rolled back on. The um, trusses were delivered on 921. All the V-groove wheels have been delivered. Uh, two, separate, <laughs> two separate boxes were finally delivered by 920. And there was a little bit of a trouble, I guess, uh, for the condition of the box. And it had to be retaped and Re repackaged and then sent on its way. But we've got everything now for the V grooves. Trust work can continue. And our contractor said that he might be able to start that within the next couple of weeks. He was obligated to a couple other smaller projects in between. And then our solar build subcontractor um, is working on gathering some stats for the concerns that our building inspector 
posed and, and wants to have some clarifications on. And then uh, we're still waiting on some estimate and uh, electric design from H&M. I asked Micah, and I know Micah has been very busy, but he did say he would work with us on that. So um, that's something that we'll probably be following up on in the near future. And then the completion date for the full build um, of the of the observatory is to be determined. We don't know yet uh, contractor availability, namely um, the electric work. The weather may not hold, hopefully it does. And then of course, we, we need a little bit more fundraising success to fund that tail end of the project as well. Through the length of our project, we've had a number of letters of support submitted. These were very useful to us in submitting grant applications. Um, normally committees and foundations are looking for you know, uh, indication that the community or whatever other organizations are involved have a, an interest, a genuine interest in the project. And so it was very helpful to get letters of support from Mayor Cogswell for the city, from Kurt Nell for the high school, from Tracy Timmons for the foundation, and from Jeremy Battles for the Red Lodge Dark Skies group, and from Dr. Lyman for general environmental and biological concerns and you know the understanding that she has about the uh, impact of dark skies on our, our wildlife and in our, envi in our environment. So all good things. And this just represents that we do have an MOU that was reviewed and approved by city council for the city of Red Lodge with Hero Steam Center. So the memorandum of understanding spells out um, the details of its operations, ownership, liability, and those responsibilities and who, who, which party they belong to. And then um, this hasn't been implemented yet because we haven't opened yet, but as far as liability, Hero Steam Center carries a million dollar liability policy with acuity through HUB. Uh, we've found that we are extended and covered uh, to the observatory because it is in the city of Red Lodge. So it's covered by the same policy that we already hold today. We are seeking a, a new policy that, or new addition to the policy that would cover us uh, as improved property, the outbuilding that sits on Van Dyke Park. We don't have the estimate back yet on what the cost per year would be for that, but it has been requested. People have been asking me how they can donate to the observatory project. So we have here a one pager front and back that describes in general what the observatory is for and what it's gonna be like. We have a couple quotes of um, from some of the letters of support that have been submitted. And of course, we've got Jeremy Battle's beautiful astrophotography. There's a QR code as well as the link. They go to the same place. It shows that we have, uh, you know, the funds raised, what we have remaining to raise. And then uh, the QR code and the link go directly into the Area Foundation and to the HEROES donation page where you can specify in a little drop-down menu that this uh, that your donation would be specifically for the observatory project. That's all this is. And then we took some questions. Any questions? Uh, that one metal piping in back of the structure, what is that? That's the brace for the solar panel. Okay. That's not a building or anything, is it? No, it's okay. just the bracing that will hold the solar panels in an array. There's a little space at the top for the wires to go down and pass through a conduit to the back of the building. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so, I, you can you can give it to me and I'll deposit it to Heroes 
observatory project, or you can go there and do it directly. Yes, yes, thank you. How many telescopes does the observatory? How many? How many have we accumulated since? Okay, we've got Tom Prosser donated one, and then Jen and Jeremy donated the Dubsonian. We have got the one from David Darby and Billings, his eight inch. So I would think between those, and then of course, Jeremy will be welcome to set his up anytime. Um, uh, we've got we've got four plus two plus, you know, people keep telling us, oh, I've got a telescope I never used. Can I give it to heroes for the observatory? Or And I always say, well, come on up and to one of the workshops first and then decide. You know, if you want to learn how to use it, you might use it, right? <laughs> so we have a lot. <laughs> Michael? Tom, Tom is an 11 inch. Yeah. You said there was a, someone that donated a telescope from Billings, a Celestron or something? A Celestron 8, 8 inch. Okay. Um, canister right eight inches cassegrain and it's uh it's old it's about 40 years old uh but he donated it so he lives in billings and he just he's gotten to the age where he he, he also has trouble lugging it around and he wants to get a smaller personal telescope so any of those stay up there permanently or will they all we'll store them up there yeah we're, i'm not i'm done lugging i'm done <laughs> every time there's a star party we we know who has to do all the luggage <laughs> Me, <laughs> Jeremy, and me, yeah, Jen. So anyway, yes, um, we'll store. That's why we need the operations and storage room. And so those will all be under lock and key. No windows. It's another good reason for no windows. <laughs> what is MOU? A memorandum of understanding. Oh. That would be between heroes and the city. It is between heroes and the city. Mm -hmm. And that was also shared with the foundation because heroes is a fiscal sponsor. So we we made sure first that they were comfortable with what we were, and they knew. I mean, we're separate, but it's just as a courtesy, they've seen it too. Are yeah. you able to take any questions off from online people? Anyone on Zoom have questions? Yeah, I had a couple. Go ahead, Sandy. If you can't get the additional 20,000 funding, at what point are you having to stop the construction? So, yeah, that's a good question, Sandy. I, I guess I wasn't clear on it. Um, we already have the funding to complete the physical build without the solar and the electrical work. So we can get the physical build without those done uh, by the end of the year and buttoned up. So you'll have doors, locks, roof, everything as a structure standalone done. And so we can continue fundraising and we will until we have enough to finish those off. But our goal is uh, fundraising that remains is only around 10,000 and some change, not 20. I thought that what I read was the um, amounts that you had applied for as grants added up to something like 23,000. Well, that's potential funding. That's potential. So we don't know yet what their decisions are or what we might be awarded. But what we have in hand already affords us to finish the building without the solar addition or the electrical addition. And so how do you do the roll off roof? Does not require electrical? Of course. The good news is it'll be buttoned up through the winter. That's, you know, that's worst case scenario. You can button up that building and have it there and you won't be able to roll it back. Actually, you're absolutely right. You won't be able to roll it back until we have the solar and the electric. But the good news is we have enough money to get it built and buttoned up at least through the winter. Out through the winter. Then the other question was on the MOU. I noticed that either party can terminate that MOU with a 30 day notice. And my concern for the city was that if something drastic happens and you don't have the money to fix the, say, slide off roof, and you decide to terminate, then the city has to assume responsibility no. for it, correct? No, that's not what that says. It says that you can terminate, either side can terminate this con, the MOU with a 30 day notice. That's standard, and every single one of the MOUs that a user group has with the city. 
I know that it's standard and and that's fine with the gazebo. It's fine with Rotary Park that has tables and and barbecues. But this actually is a machine. And if in fact that roof breaks down, who knows for what reason, maybe the snow load. Um, and the steam center can't or doesn't have the funds to repair it. They could cancel and terminate the MOU with a 30 day notice. I don't it, know why anybody would go to such trouble as building an observatory and then letting it sit there unused and broken. Totally understand that, but there isn't a big pot of money that well, I will we'll write more grants. Let me finish. Don't anywhere, Sandy, I'll be here. Kick there going to be, is there going to be a fund for repairs as needed? Well, we'll start up an endowment. Actually, that's something we've talked about in our grant applications. We aren't there yet. First, we have to build it, and then we'll work on endowments. Those are my questions. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Hey, Mark. He's out on the tower somewhere. Wrap up on you know, I I can understand what you're saying with some of the fun, but it's also the case that we're heroes to walk away from such a project. That's a fifty thousand dollar investment that they're walking away. Why would I walk I away? I'm putting it in memory of my right. husband. Yeah. And I, the I steam center. Like, I don't have <laughs> Why would I walk away? We have time to put together an endowment once it's built. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Actually, Sandy, I, I I understand the concern. The city doesn't want to have anything thrown at it or, you know, be forced to accept something because they didn't plan for it and somebody else did. I understand that. Um, so we do plan on an endowment and working toward that once it's built. Uh, there's also a phase three we never even talked about yet. And then one of the grants is actually um, targeted um, and el we're eligible in phase three to utilize and not for the capital build. So um, there are a number of improvements that we'd want to make as well, like providing benches for people or getting a couple step stools for short people that can't see out the top of the, the scopes that are set up. Or, uh, you know, <laughs> you don't have that problem. You can laugh. <laughs> we know, don't we, Jen <laughs> and Polly? Um, so, so it, yes, the struggle is real. And, um, so phase three, some of the grant writing out there will will hopefully come in to help us with that. Um, but we plan on a lot more grant writing in the future. And, and we, the last thing we want is for this also to land and do not plan for it to land in the city's lap. Any other questions? Isn't that the intent of the insurance? So that's, well, the insurance isn't there yet because uh, we have liability, but we don't have outbuilding insurance yet, not until it's completed. So at least the structure, and we've already asked for that estimate from the same third party out of hub that gives us our insurance for liability as Hero Steam Center. So that'll be an add-on. Once it's built, we'll have a yearly um, charge for the insurance of the outbuild. They call it outbuilding insurance itself. Yeah, we'll be covered. Check the chat. Chat. Chat, chat, chat. Okay. Oh, Sandy, did you have a different question for? Am I looking for something different in chat? Well, the insurance kind of uh, interested me as well. I think that events in Red Lodge, the city asked for $2 million in liability. If they don't have an MOU, we have an MOU. No, what I'm what I'm saying is, you said that that the Hero Steam Center was going to provide insurance, and the MOU didn't mention what to what amount that insurance would cover. I can't answer that. Okay. And, and I'm only using the city's. Um, We're not using the city's. Is, I think it's two million dollars for an event when We're some have an event. Right. So we're covered under the Heroes Steam Center's liability, not the city's. 
No, I, I understand that. What I'm saying is once you get the insurance on the outbuilding, how much insurance had you thought about adding? The outbuilding insurance would cover the structure itself and against harm and destruction, not the people. And I so the li liability then would be under your steam center liability. That's, that's correct. Yep. And how much is that? Is it does that match that two million dollars that the city asks? No. So there was another. Um, what was it? The uh, land use and planning, the whole thing that went through for um, the way it was worded, Sandy. Now I don't know if Jen could go back and check or someone, but. The way it was worded that anybody that had an MOU with the city didn't have to increase it to 2 million at the time that that ordinance was passed. It's and worded I, that way. I do think that the plan, I do think that the parks, like I do think Courtney's recommended the parks be able to just update all the MOUs for all of the user groups and all of the parks mm -hmm. to reflect that. Um, I don't know yeah. how far along she is in that process, yeah. but I, I do think. Yeah, um, it's being looked at then. Yeah. Um, if it is the case that the city traditionally treats user groups differently than just somebody renting the park. And, and we're not serving alcohol right. or food right. and all that other stuff. Right. And there's not people running around. It's just standing there on the pad looking at stuff. <laughs> but but I understand. So we'll see if anything comes of the uh, revisions, Sandy. Okay. Any other um, questions? Yes, Sean. I was just curious, like, um, are there plans for bathrooms, porta potties, or is parking across for like on the rodeo grounds? Park parking's parking? on the street where, where people have been parking there when they show up to stargazing. It's not been an issue. Um, people don't tend to stay long. They come, they look, they leave. So when we have a stargazing event, it's not like you're going to have people there for two hours solid. They'll come and they'll go. And that's the way it's been. It's been in waves. So there's not really a need for a toilet. We don't have a toilet. We don't plan on a toilet. If we're forced to get a toilet, we'll have to have another whole, you know, does does the park want another structure in the park? I don't know. But um, really the way it's used is people are, are passing in and out. They're not staying great lengths of time. Any other questions? It opens up the door, though, for all sorts of ideas. I appreciate the uh, novelty of the project um, to have an observatory. And, you know, there has been a lot of chit chat about the sure has. bathrooms downtown. And, yeah. You know, um, that's always kind of something that comes up in conversations. Maybe we could find something that's definitely nice. Yeah, we can we can all continue thinking, can, can, just like in coding, um, continuous improvement. So, um, what was the other thing I wanted to say though? Um, I was it it does like you said affords different opportunities and thinking about different things. And one of the latest things I thought about was. You know, I know there's concern for the native vegetation and having it repopulated and educating the community about things like that. And so I uh, offered and started talking to Doug Reynolds about why don't you have a talk out there on the concrete structure? So you've got opportunities to have, you know, other groups use it outside, albeit outside, you know, they're not stargazing, but it, it, in the day, you don't want people trampling all through and you could, you could, you could give presentations. They could be about the native vegetation and point out different things to educate the community about other than the just the dark sky. It, it could be used for a lot. Of, who knows what other ideas people will have for the use of the observatory. You know, plane spotters out there. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Teresa, yes, what's the best way for individuals to learn of the events that are going on at the observatory if they're not on Facebook? And we're, we're developing a website for the STEAM Center, which will include our, our program centers, you know, including information about the youth programs and presentations the public might be sharing. 
and then one category for the observatory and one for red large dark skies because there's an awful lot going on and we of course will keep a calendar on there um, we were shooting for the end of this month but I don't see that happening so we got to get back once this on its way again get back over there and start you know um, pressing for the completion of our website <laughs> yeah yeah any other questions you know, Michael, you brought up a good point, though. Um, we're Once this is built, we can start, everybody get chamber chat or the chamber, what's happening in Red Lodge today, you know? So all that stuff, we can start saying, this is what's planned for the observatory. Come on up or, yeah, yeah. And keeping in mind that some people don't want to be on the Facebook, so. I know, I, what you said I know. A website, because I would go. Yeah, we need a website, or, yeah. Yeah, a newsletter that's sent out weekly. Okay. What kind of frequency of use do you envision for the observatory? Like you said that the astronomy teacher is very supportive. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know how often he might want to use it. But when we sat down, he discussed and shared with me the example of, oh, we're lucky if we can stand out at the top of Coal Miners Park once or twice in the fall before it's, you know, wind and rain and snow and ice and they can't go anywhere right so if he has this available to him i can't answer how often he might use it but i would estimate you know maybe six times through the year who knows he he had them come to one of our stargazing events in lieu of one of the assignments for his class so he's also been pushing you know helping to integrate them with the community in stargazing events and I can only imagine that they will certainly take take advantage of the observatory. Dark skies is having been on average once a month um, since a couple of years ago. So I would imagine it would only increase from there. Well, in the strategic planning event alone, we we committed to at least eight. Was that the minimum? We said, oh, we'll have at least eight events. But you have to remember, um, because some of those were going to be off-site down at the we're trying to collaborate with the, Yellow, the Yellowstone Wildlife Sanctuary. Some of our events would be held down there to because it is a draw. It helps them to bring people in when you when you combine different um, activities. And so they kind of go hand in hand with the nocturnal animals and their habits and the dark sky and observing. So it's a really good fit. And the next one's tomorrow. <laughs> and the next one's tomorrow. <laughs> Autumnal equinox. Sanctuary. Oh, yeah. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Happy oh, sorry. <laughs> so, yeah. So, um, we don't know. I mean, we can plan and plan and plan, but if it's cloudy or rotten weather. <laughs> however, I will say the Green Comet, we had 50 people out that night in 13 degree weather. To go out and stand on the pad mm -hmm. in in the middle of Van Dyke Park, mm -hmm. coming and going, not all at once, coming and going. <laughs> so, I I'd say there's an interest in this community, and that the resolution holds true. People are interested, and there's a, a reason for and and there's a reason the city supports the observatory, and we're we're happy to do it. You know, Heroes is thrilled, Red Lodge Dark Skies is thrilled, and um, it can only get better. Happy, <laughs> we're doing it. Uh, any any other comments, concerns, or questions on the Zoom before I cut off? Okay, goodbye, everybody on Zoom. <laughs>